Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. You were born in Massachusetts, if I'm not wrong, right? Yes. You are a man who went all over the world since very young. Why did you decide to fix your life in Hawaii? Well, I fell in love with a local woman. That was one persuasive part of it. But also, I've traveled a lot. And Hawaii is like a third world country. It's like a banana republic with a lot of advantages. It doesn't have the usual deficits that a third world country has. It's an archipelago of islands, and it's Polynesia, but it's also Main Street, USA. It has very good hospitals. It has good schools. It has probably the best climate I've ever seen in my life. It has a perfect climate. The people are very friendly, local people. I've lived here 35 years. <laughs> you were born in Massachusetts from a Catholic yeah. family. You were a Boy Scout. I mean, you had a perfect American Catholic young boy education. Your parents' father was French origin, your mother Italian origin, but still you are American. But you speak English like an English person. It's because you lived in London for so long, because you lived in the Far East, because you lived in Africa. I don't know. I think I talk the way people in Boston talk. I mean, I don't have any special accent. As a teacher, I was resident in Africa and Southeast Asia for 10 years. And then I lived for almost 18 years in England, 28 years altogether. So I think you lose something and you gain something when you're an expatriate for that length of time. But it was cultural enrichment as far as I could tell. I mean, I was always looking for a place to live. And one of the secrets of happiness, which the Russians know, is to have two houses. You have a house, and then you have a dacha. In my case, I live here in Hawaii. I have a little farm, and I have a house in Cape Cod. It's made me very happy. The idea of living in the same place for 12 months of the year is dispiriting to me. It's uh, very discouraging. It's not in your DNA. I mean, since very young, you didn't want to be a bourgeois in Boston in your family. You moved far away and uh, you traveled all your life in the most strange, difficult, remote places. You don't look like a settled person in a, this kind of life. But the question is, where do you write better? How do you write? You write longhand, you write with a computer, you write uh, anywhere. No, I write with a Lamy pen. This is a Lamy pen. And I write on paper. That's a serious question, and it's an interesting question. And it's a question that very few people ask. How do you write? What is the process of writing? People think, oh, writing, that's just incidental. You type it or you use a computer. But to me, the creative process is bound up with writing in longhand, crossing it out, starting again, recopying the page. My last book was called Burma Sahib. It was almost 500 pages of handwriting. You write on any kind of copybook or school copybook? No, or no. You, no. You're, you're very fussy about where you write? I'm very fussy about the paper, which is high-quality lined white paper, which is A4 paper. What I was saying is that at the end of a book, I have four or 500 pages, and then I type it. I mean, I'm quite a good typist. But here's the thing. Sometimes people say to me, I've written something, Mr. Theroux, you're a, you publish books. What shall I do? How can I improve what I've written? And I say to them, this has happened to me a number of times. I say, well, Betty, here's what you must do. I've just read your chapter, and here's what you must do. Sit down with this piece that you've typed and copy it in longhand. Write the whole chapter out, 5,000 words or whatever. And I said, I guarantee you, if you write it by longhand, it will improve. And do you know what? Invariably, they say, oh, that's too much work. And I say, you're a moron. Writing is work. And particularly, <laughs> handwriting is work, but that will improve it. And they say, no, no, I couldn't possibly do that. And I think, well, you're not a writer. You will never be a writer. You're not a writer. It won't but happen. Many American writers, until there were computers, they used to write with pencils 
and yellow pads, you know, many American famous writers. Among them, some you corresponded with, for instance, William Styron, I read, among the people who... Uh, and William was writing longhand, I remember, in Connecticut. Uh, That's true. On yellow legal pads. You like a ball pen. I used to have a, a fountain pen. It was a Parker pen. It was it, nothing special, but it had the right nib. I write with a very narrow nib. And my house was broken into and the pen was stolen. They just emptied a drawer and they took everything. In. And I've never been able to replace that. But a Lamy pen has a very thin nib and has a large amount of ink. And also, it's ergonomic. You can hold it. William Styron, yes, used to write in longhand. He couldn't type. He didn't know how to type. Yeah, many other people have done it. I need white I mean, paper. How do you write? I mean, do you write in the morning, in the evening, in your study? How many hours? Hemingway used to say you have to finish before you lose concentration and then start the next day, right? He, he said that, you know, even if we, you think you could write more, stop it and start the next day. What do you do? What is Paul Theroux? Has it changed over the years or it's always the same? No, it's different. When I lived in England, I lived in a house. I actually bought a house in a very poor district, but because it was a house, it was a detached house. That's when you lived in in Dorset or in London? No, no, in London. South London. So I could only live in a city where I could live in a house. In London, you can live in a house. Rome, no. Paris, unlikely. Berlin, unlikely. New York, some people have houses, but I needed to live in a house where it's quiet. So my method was because the weather was so bad, I just woke up in the morning. And as soon as the house was empty, my children went to school, my wife went to work. When the house was empty, I sat down to work. If I started before they left, someone would say, my wife would say, I can't find my keys. I'm looking for them. What are we doing? And she would interrupt. So I'd say, well, we'll find your keys. And then you go. And then when the door closed and the house was in total silence, I could sit down and work. So that was Usually bad weather, and I worked all morning. I had lunch, then I went for a bicycle ride in the afternoon, and I sometimes worked in the evening before my wife came home from work and before the children came home from school. I could only work uninterruptedly. Here in Hawaii, I do the same. My wife also works. She goes to work. When she goes to work, I sit down and write. So I need absolute silence. Um, I can't bear people talking to me or the phone ringing or any of that. So... And like most writers, I procrastinate. I sit down and I don't write right away. But I can say, Alain, that from 19, roughly 1963 or 64, which is 60 years, I have always been working on a book. There's never been a period in my life when I wasn't working on a book. So I wake up in the morning with something to do. The problem is, how do you resume I try to get into the mood and I try to stimulate that. William Styron is a good example of someone. He wrote a book, then he didn't do anything for a couple of years, then he wrote another book, then he didn't do anything for a number of years, then he wrote another book. He wrote four long books. I knew him very well, actually, and I often saw him. He was very melancholy. He had serious depression. My life would be more easily compared to uh, George Simenon than to Styron or to other people. Simonon wrote a book, and then he wrote another book, and then he wrote another book. you don't smoke pipes like (laughs) Simonon. I used to. I used to. I also have not slept with 10,000 women like Simonon. But Simonon is one of my favorite writers. Yeah, he was a good writer. Very good. Not only make prayer, but in your life, you have been in correspondence with major writers who, I don't know if they were all your friends, but from Gore Vidal to Bruce Chatwin to Iris Murdoch, Stephen Spenter, Nadine Gordimer, I mean, Graham Greene. But your friend, the one that is more mentioned when one writes about your life, was V.S. Naipaul, right? And you, you were very good friends until you wrote Sir Vidya's showdown, I don't know if it's the right pronunciation for the book, but where you change your view on him and this created a break and then you repatched in 2011, just one year before he died. So was he very important in your life? Was it a major friendship encounter vis-a-vis the others or not? 
No, it was a major event in my life. You started our conversation by suggesting that I was a member of the bourgeoisie. I was not. We were <laughs> we were lower middle class. We were not bourgeois. I my ambition was to be bourgeoisie, to be bourgeois, <laughs> but I failed. <laughs> we failed. I grew up in a family of seven children, so. My parents read books, but I never knew a writer. So I didn't know a real writer till I met Naipaul. And I met Naipaul in 1966 in Uganda, in Africa. And that was a major event in my life. First, he was an extremely good writer. As you know, he is a great writer. He was a very flawed man. He was actually crazy in some respects. He was very depressive. He was bi probably bipolar. He could be very violent to women. He could be very violent to other people too, screaming and He was possessed with a kind of rage that you find with people of color, you might say, Indians, West Indians, Africans, who live in basically a white society. So he got over that. But when I met him, I said, what's the greatest compliment you can pay to a writer? Read his books or her books, right? So when he came to Uganda, he had published five books. I read all the books. So when I met him, he said, have you ever read anything I've written? I said, yes. He said, what? I said, I've read all, everything you've written. And then he tested me. He said, what about this? What about this? What I've described him as like a drill sergeant in the army. At ease, attention, stop. What's that? What are you doing? What is your major malfunction, numbnuts? What is your problem? Like a drill sergeant, the kind of sergeant that you would terrify a recruit. But I liked it. I thought, this is great. This man is taking me seriously. So he read things that I wrote, and he was the first person in my life to take me seriously as a writer. And at that time, I didn't know this, but he was struggling. He was a struggling writer. He was very underpaid. In Uganda, he was being paid by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was an aspect of the CIA. He found that out later. So he was basically just a teacher. He hated it. He hated Africa. He was very uncomfortable with Africans. But he, it was a major event in my life because he took me seriously. And he also asked me important questions. I mean, when he read something I wrote, he would analyze it. And he would say, why did you write this? Why, did you write, why don't you do this? He took me seriously and he liked what I wrote. And he introduced me to people. So when I quit my job in 1971 in Singapore, my wife was English, my then wife, my ex-wife. And I said, well, let's go to England. And Naipaul's there. I can live in the country. I can work. And I will have a friend, my only friend, really. We fell out. It's a long story, but Savidia's Shadow is the book, explains how I became a writer, my relationship with Naipaul. But it wasn't a year before he died. I reconnected with him in 2011 at the Hay Festival. And he was alive. He didn't die till 2018. So I knew for the last seven years of his life, I was there at his deathbed when he was in the hospital. So he's a very important figure. But at the end of his life, the last 10 or 15 years of his life, he calmed down. He was married to a very kindly, motherly woman. And he was a happier man. But In his early life, he was angry, difficult, explosive, sadistic to women, and unfaithful. He was When my book was published, people said, how could you be so cruel to this man? I described what he had done. And then his biography was published, written by Patrick French. And people said, oh, I see. He's worse. <laughs> <laughs> But let's But talk anyway. about Paul Theroux. I mean, I know you're fascinated by writing somehow, because maybe it's your last book. I'm not sure. Burma Sahib, the book that takes place in Burma. Your character, Eric Blair, he's George Orwell somehow, yes. right? I mean, you, you took inspiration about George Orwell. And it's an interesting book, because it is a man who quits school, he's a policeman in Burma, he's in the police, and then he realizes that the British Empire was not very good, right? He changed his mind. If I understand well, he feels the opposed after that, the despotic nature of the British Empire, right? And he becomes anti-colonial, quite modern in a way, because this is what's going on today. I don't know if this yes. is a metaphor to explain the world of today, but... All that is true. The unusual thing about George Orwell is that he wasn't born George Orwell. He was born Eric Blair. He was a student at the best school in England, Eton College. Very expensive, very exclusive. Blair's father did not go to Eton. Blair's father was an opium agent in India. And Blair was born in Motihari in Bengal. So after Eton, what do you do? He was thinking, what shall I do? 
Should I go to Oxford? Should I get a job? His father said, no, 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 Eric, go to Burma. You have a family in Burma. His mother's family were called Limousine. They were from Limoges, and they were French shipbuilders, antique merchants. So Orwell was half French, and his family still lived in Moulmain in Burma. So he thought, I want adventure. I like Rudyard Kipling. He's stimulating. My father was in the British Empire. I have family in Burma, and I don't know what to do, and I'm 19 years old. What shall I do? He became a policeman. Well, that's a radical departure from Eton. It's a radical departure from anything. So when you think that George Orwell started life first as a, what he called, upper, lower, middle class boy, then went to Eton, then joined the empire, became a colonialist. And not just any old colonialist, he became a policeman. He was whipping people, flogging people, hanging people, shooting an elephant. He talks about how he used to hit his servants. Well, I lived in Central Africa and I had servants. I never would have hit my servants, you know, but he said he used to punch them. Okay, so much for Eric Blair. At the end of it, it was a testing time. If you want to know the process, the process is read a book. Do you know Octave Manoni? Manoni wrote a book called Prospero and Caliban. The French title is different. A man called Albert Memmi, The Colonized and the Colonizer, or the fundamental book about colonialism, Franz Fanon, The Damné de la Terre. So Orwell lived that experience, the experience of a colonial officer who wasn't really up to the job, who had a slight inferiority complex, and like a lot of colonial people, was not a privileged person in any respect, came from a lower middle class family. But when you're in the colonies, your accent improves, your class improves, you have money, and you have servants. So Fanon describes this process of how the colonizer is coarsened by the experience. But at the same time, he improves himself socially. So all of this was very confusing to Eric Blair, who, after five years, realized, I have made a huge mistake. I'm part of the worst system, a racket, the colonial system. What do I do? He did an amazing thing. He became a dishwasher at a restaurant in Paris. He went from Eton to five years in the police to being a dishwasher. And then he wrote a book about being a dishwasher, down and out in Paris and London. Then he wrote a book about Burma called Burmese Days. It's an amazing trajectory for a person. And when you read a biography of Orwell, also he changed his name, I may say. So changing his name, changing his profession, that was very important. If you read a biography of Orwell, you see what's the shortest chapter. It's the chapter in Burma. Because biographers don't speculate. They don't say, maybe this happened or this could have happened. They say, we don't know, so we can't speculate. Well, a novelist speculates. And that's my role in life, is to speculate, to invent, to imagine, and to create the person that he was. I think you wrote 56 books, if I'm not wrong, right? Between travel, novels, nonfiction. I mean, as you said, you work all the time on a book. Yes. And yes. most of this work of yours, I mean, not the physical books, I don't know if the physical books, but most of your correspondence with all these writers, most of your notebooks of your archive are now at the Huntington Library in Pasadena, no? near Pasadena. That, that's correct. You wrote many books, many of these books became also famous movies or TV series, Mosquito yes. Coat, for instance. But uh, the great Railway Bazaar in your early stages, I think it's 76, became your first big bestseller, right? Because you, yeah. you were living in England, but uh, you describe a trip from England to Japan, right? I mean, you cross Europe, Asia, to Japan by train. Yes. So why did you do that? I had published a book because I didn't have an idea. I had lived abroad for 10 years. I never wrote a travel book. I didn't even like travel books. The first sentence of Tris Tropique, the Claude Lévi-Strauss book, is uh, about, I don't particularly like travel books, and here I am writing one. Another famous writer who wrote a wonderful book on Italy is Stendhal. Another one is Goethe. I mean, famous of, writers of wrote course. also 
they wrote much better about Italy than Italians, and in Sandal or Goethe or President de Brosso. So it is an interesting genre. It's a very strange <laughs> type of book because it's memoir, it's autobiography, it's geography, it's epistolary. One of my favorite books about Italy is by Carlo Levi. Christ. Yeah, it's a great book. Christ and, stopped in Italy. Right. But also, he was from Florence, and then he went to Southern, he went to Basilicata. So being Basilicata is like being in a foreign country among yeah. people he didn't recognize. I mean, he was like a traveler to a distant land, not to Italy at all. So I, I did have successful books before then. I wrote a book called St. Jack, set in Singapore. It was made into a movie. That was successful, but it sold moderately well. But the Great Railway Bazaar... But you also had trouble for some of your books, right? I mean, some of your books were oh, yeah, forbidden yes. to be published, or you were kicked out. I mean, yes. your literature was not completely... I mean, there was trouble there. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of trouble, actually. I was deported from Malawi. So I went to Nyasaland, and that was my first experience of a British colony. So I actually understood when Franz Fanon or Manoni are writing about colonialists, I understand that. I understand what they're writing about because I actually lived in a British colony. That's a very rare thing. I mean, it was 1963. Nyasaland was a British colony. I was there when it became independent seven months later. But to return to the Railway Bazaar, the book sold a million copies. Well, I mean, if you sell a million copies, that's a bestseller. That's not sell like doing well. But when you sell a million or a million and a half copies, it's okay. As far as trouble, my books were banned. When I was in Africa, my books were banned in South Africa. But it's a great story too. You know, when I wrote The Mosquito Coast, it was banned in South Africa. All my books were banned in South Africa under the white government. When Nelson Mandela became president and the country became independent, my publisher in London called me and he said, I've got some good news. We have an order for 100,000 copies of the Mosquito Coast. And I said, really? Why? That's amazing. He said, yeah, it's going to be a school book. So it was banned in South Africa, then it was released. and then it, In schools. <laughs> then it was studied in schools. So that's a great thing. Well, that's a great achievement. But tell me, why did you decide and how did you write the Railway Bazaar? You wrote it during the trip. You came back home and you wrote it by memory. At the time, I read a book called the West Indies and the Spanish Main by Anthony Trollope. And Anthony Trollope described his writing method in it. He said, Anthony Trollope, you may or may not know this, was a post office official. So he worked for the post office. He also wrote novels, as we know, 60 odd books. But he was also a travel writer. He wrote a book about America, he wrote a book about Australia. But he said, every day, at the end of the day, I wrote about what happened to me that day in Cuba, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, and in Nicaragua. So he wrote, on the ship. And he said, so when the ship arrived back in England, my book was done. I just said the end, that was it. So I thought I'm going to do the same thing. Every day I'm going to write what happened to me, dialogue, description, everything. And so I had notebooks, big notebooks, and I wrote them and I carried them with me. I think there's four or five of them. I can't remember the actual number, but they were. I remember they were big. And so when I arrived back in London, and I took the uh, trans. How long did it take the trip? Four and a half months, too long. I came back to a broken marriage, an unhappy wife, children who uh, barely recognized me. It was just terrible. It was one of the worst experiences of my life returning from this long trip. When I left, my wife, my wife's boyfriend had moved into the house. So I came back to a, a very unhappy house. So what do you do if you come back to an unhappy house? You write a book that's full of life. You say, you turn your back on that. And you say, I'm going to turn this into gold. I'm going to be an alchemist. So I wrote the book. Writing the book wasn't difficult because I had the book in notebooks. So when I came back, I put, just put my notebook down and I just typed the book. It was simple. The book took me, I think, less than three months to write. It's not a great book, but at the time... It seemed to be an unusual book because no one was doing it. What's easy then? You get on a train in London, you go to Paris, you get the train to Istanbul, you get another train, go to Tehran, you get another train, you go to Afghanistan. I mean, well, there are no trains in Afghanistan, so I skipped through. But what's easier than that? It seemed to me a simple... I remember Naipaul saying with envy, he said, it's a delicious idea. I mean, he's a delicious idea. So the book was successful and that helped a lot. I mean, it helped my morale. And I thought, well, I've done that once. I can do it again. So I wrote a book about China. I wrote a book about England. From Boston to Argentina. 
from yeah, yeah, the yeah. old Patagonia Express, from South Pacific visiting China. I mean, you wrote yeah. from Cairo to Cape Town. You did all these trips, and also you went to Mexico by car. You wrote another book about that. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was enjoyable. All of those books are different. I still somewhat despise travel books. And now I don't know what they're about, but I had favorite travel books, I had books that I really, really loved. Levi Strauss, you know, it's not, it's a book of anthropology, great book, actually. And you mentioned Goethe, Goethe, the same thing. So it's a form where there are classics, but now <laughs> there are too many of them and they're not very good. But I kept learning how to do it, how to travel. You take a trip. What's the itinerary? And I was thinking, I want to go to this place. How can I do it? How can I see it at its best? So you mentioned my Africa book. I went to Cairo, to Cape Town, but I went overland. I thought I took a bus. I took a train. I took a taxi. I walked. And I never left the ground. I never took a plane. I just stayed on the ground all the way down the Nile, through the Sudan. And I ended up in Cape Town. That's one of my favorite books. Very difficult book. It was physically difficult. It was dangerous. I had a lot of problems writing it. People say, oh, it's a lot of trouble. And why do you do it? I said, well, trouble is the whole point. If you have a lot of incidents of difficulty, trouble, near-death experiences, there's the book. That's the book. That's what you want to do. Take a risk. But you said, or you wrote, I don't know, that one needs happiness to write well. Yeah, but it doesn't I, seem true. I mean, you were not very happy when you were in London and your wife was with someone else and you wrote your successful book and then to do this trip was not very happy either, no? I mean, it's dangerous. And You could say that, but actually the act of writing is to me joyous. It's a happy act. I think of writing as a very joyful thing. It helps to be happy to write. But the process of writing can lift your spirits. I'm never more happy than when I've had a good day writing. At the end of the day, if I've written something, two pages, one page, one paragraph, if it's felicitous, if it's good, if it's memorable, if it's the best I can do, I th I'm happy. And then I go to the beach, I'll go swimming. I think, well, that's my day. Are you a slow writer or a quick writer? Slow, very slow. That's the whole point about writing by hand. You can't write quickly by hand. You can only write slowly. It's almost like a plastic art. You understand plastic art? It's like yes. sculpture or something. Yes, sculpture. It's, I it's, agree. It's, it's like the plastic art when you're writing by hand. When you're typing, it's a mechanical act, and you can do it very fast. Simonon typed. Henry Miller typed. Henry Miller was a very fast typist. I know when I'm typing, I'm writing too fast. I need to write slowly. So I've written a lot, but I write steadily and slowly. I just write all the time. I don't do anything else. I'm not a teacher. You know, I don't have another job. I don't do anything else. I mean, you did two experiences. You worked from some photographs. You work with Steve McCurry. Yes, that's right. The Imperial Way. And then you also worked with National Geographic, I think, with him. And then the, you had another experience that you wrote, I think you wrote a book or, with Bruce Chatwin going back to Patagonia. I mean, how is for you to work with someone else? Usually it's terrible writing with someone else <laughs> and because a person has a different method. Bruce Chatwin was a very difficult person. He was very excitable. And he said, oh, this is going to be terrible. The book was called Patagonia Revisited. It was actually a lecture that we gave at the Royal Geographical Society. I was going to say, you mentioned my the letters to writers. I've written a lot of letters to writers. I would much rather write a letter to a writer than spend time with him or her in person. So that's ideal. Talking to a writer on the telephone or writing a letter, perfect. But traveling with them, or being on a project, that's horrible. It's horrible. Writers are unbalanced people. No one was crazier than Naipaul. And even William Styron was suicidal. He was very difficult to be with. But write them a letter and get a letter back, that's wonderful. So I've worked with other people. Steve McCurry is a great photographer, but I don't enjoy traveling with a photographer. When I travel, I'm, I drive, Steve's in the seat. He says, stop, 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 stop. And he takes a picture and I'm sitting in the car waiting. Oh, I'm his chauffeur. You know, <laughs> that's no fun. He's a wonderful guy and a great photographer. We traveled in the South. I wrote a book called Deep South about the South, traveling through the South. We traveled together some of the time. But when he left, I was very happy that he would leave. We only spent maybe a week at a time. And then he would leave and I was on my own. I can only travel alone to write well. 
Why did you write that? with Chatwin? He wrote his own book in Patagonia. You wrote your book on Patagonia. Why did you make this book or had this lecture together? Why? He got in touch with me and said that the Royal Geographical Society wanted us to give a talk. And I said, well, why don't you write about your version of Patagonia and I'll write about my version of Patagonia. And at the same time, the Royal Geographical Society has photographs. I don't know what the Italian or French equivalent of the Royal Geographical is. I'm sure they have it, but it's a repository of photographs, documents, of pictures, of etchings, of paintings, and a lot about Patagonia. So the lecture was in a hall. It was actually one of the great experiences of my life. I'm not exaggerating to say that it was one of the high points of my life to be with Bruce standing at a podium in the dark and pictures of Patagonia, penguins, Magellan, giants, the landscape of Patagonia being projected on the screen and he and I taking turns talking. The hall was full of people, eminent explorers and travelers, and we were there. It was an hour or an hour and a half. It was a wonderful experience. He suggested that we should do it, or the university did, the society did. We did it together. It's a small book, but it was a very satisfying experience. And then I saw him a lot afterwards. He was a very slow writer. He was very explosive. So he wrote a book, and then he couldn't write, and then he would travel. He was half socialite and half nomad. <laughs> when a Herzog did a documentary about him called Nomad, as though he was just a nomad. Well, he wasn't just a nomad. He actually had very important, very powerful friends, socialites, wealthy people, patrons of the arts. So he needed to be with people. He once said, I want to visit you in the States. And I said, you know, I'm writing a book. No, I can't. I thought if he comes and stays, he'll talk all the time. I won't be able to write. Sadly, he died young. He was a writer, but he didn't start as a literary figure. I mean, he was an auction, he was an expert of art, he worked in auction, he was a journalist. I mean, he became a writer later, right? Yes, that's right. Know. No, that's right. He was working for Sotheby's, and his field of his subject was 10th, 11th century Central Asia, nomads of Central Asia. And he talked about how the relationships between one nomadic tribe and another nomadic tribe, and he even related to the Inuit people who went to Alaska and people in Africa. The symbolism of that, that was his field. He valued paintings. The field of the auction house is all about money, and he got sick of it. And so he just went on an impulse. He went to Patagonia. And then it turned out to be a wonderful book. And then he tried to do it again. He went to Australia. His books, they're very thin, and there aren't many of them, but they're very good. Do you think that Songlines, his book on Australia, is comparable to the book on Australia that was written by Robert Hughes? I mean, I don't know if you read them both. No, I read them both. I read them both. They're different books. He had a theory. He always had a coming, theory. They're both coming from art background, which you don't. But in the same time, they wrote this book about Australia, for instance. The difference between the books are... Chatwin was very interested in indigenous people. Do you know the book Crowds and Power by Elias Canetti? Masun yes. Mach. Masun Mach. Si, 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 si. Okay, well, he had the same interests in Aboriginal people that Canetti had. Canetti said, very interesting, he said, Aborigines are the aristocrats of the earth, the world's aristocrats, the oldest people, the noblest people, and they have connection with the earth that nobody else has. So Chatwin had the same view. Not intellectual, but he saw that song lines, the dream state that Aborigines have, is something that could be translated into a travel book. Hughes is not interested. Hughes is more interested in exploration and whatnot. But I mean, Australian writing is amazingly interesting. Neither of them mentions Patrick White, who's Australia's greatest novelist. Australians are very conflicted about their art and their writing. I think Patrick White, who won the Nobel Prize, by the way, was a much greater writer than either of these two guys. But Chatwin was, he had a theory in Patagonia, he had a theory in Australia. And then he also, he could embroider, he could make things bigger. You know, he spent one night in jail in Dahomey a long time ago. He was arrested. And he writes about it as though he's Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You know, he's like, well, I spent this night. And you think, well, it was one night in jail. You know, Bruce, come on, it was one night in jail. But he makes a lot of it. He had a dramatic side, too. And, well, that's what writers do. They exaggerate. Well, but, he, but what is interesting is that you talk about your craft, you talk about your need to write all the time a book, 
you talk about friends, writers, you talk about, yeah, but you read a lot. It seems that, you know, since you talk, you talk about Levi Strauss, you talk this, that, you have read plenty of books. You don't say, when do you read? I read every day. I read every day. I mentioned Fanon. I've just read a biography of Franz Fanon called The Rebel's Clinic by Adam Schatz. Prior to that, I read the Manoni book, apropos of my uh, Burma Sahib. I read at the beach. I have a special chair here that I read. Reading made me a writer. Reading made me a traveler. Travel made me a writer. I came from a big family. How do you find privacy in a big family? By reading. reading. You go in a corner and you read and you retreat to a book. So I was reading them. I started my life reading. You know, one of the amazing things and one of the pleasures of my life is that the writers that I read as a schoolboy, I eventually ended up meeting. So there's a famous comic writer, S.J. Perelman. He wrote for The New Yorker, but he wrote a lot of very, very funny books. When I was in high school, I read his book. I thought, this man, he's the funniest man. Eventually in London, I met him and I said, you know, I love your books. And he did the same thing. What do you like? And I would mention, how do you flatter a writer or impress a writer? You tell them, I like this page. I like this description. I like this character. I was impressed by this. And so I read Graham Greene, then I met Graham Greene. I read Angus Wilson, then I met him. B.S. Pritchard. Why did you I, like I, Graham Greene? You said you like, wait, you said you like Simeno and you yeah. like Graham Greene. Yeah. One talks about, how can I say, Simeno, Maigret, you know, murders, detective well, stories. Maigret, uh, and the other Simeno. one talks about spying. Why I, are you interested in these two particular writers? If they seem to be the ideal life, which is a life of writing that combined with travel, combined with a degree of celebrity fame, which is, to me, when I was growing up, it's no longer the case, but a writer was a power figure. It was a powerful figure, and partly powerful because they were an outlaw, because they were outside the law, because they made their own rules. They were slightly dangerous because their books were banned. I grew up in a period when you couldn't buy Henry Miller's books. Graham Greene's books were banned by the, the Vatican, said The Power and the Glory is a bad book. It's a very anti-Catholic book. You can't. The idea of becoming a figure who is powerful, notorious, well-traveled, and successful, that appealed to me a lot. So there's an element of drama, conceit, and I don't know, celebrity, I suppose, to do with it. And if you come from a a little family, you know, outside Boston, you think, well, this is the ideal life. Graham Greene seemed to me to live an admirable life. It was an unhappy life. You find out later, he wasn't happy. He was miserable. He had a bipolar personality and he had Catholicism on the brain. And that I now see that his Catholicism is a big flaw in his books. It was just a theory about damnation. Well, damnation is a silly idea. That's a silly concept. The idea that you die and then you're going to go to hell. That's something that you hear from people in New Guinea or the Congo. Oh, we're going to die and we're all going to burn. But a rational person can't possibly believe that. Graham Greene, I liked his work. I met him. I liked him as a man. Some of his books I thought were great. Others not so much. But more recently, I thought, this is a dead end. You can't write about religion. You can't be guided by religion. Simenon was not a religious person. I mentioned them, but I i mean, there are writers that I care much more. You don't Joshua. mention... You don't mention Hemingway, another... Unhappy. No, no, I hated Hemingway, and I still dislike Hemingway. People were saying, oh, read Hemingway, read Hemingway. And I used to say, Hemingway is just a guy who has this very odd, self-conscious way of writing. In other words, his writing style is, you can mimic it easily. I could write like Hemingway. That's just silly. And also, who is he writing about? He's writing about people I'm not interested in. When I went to Africa, people used to talk about Hemingway. Hemingway d doesn't know anything about Africa. I could speak Swahili. When you read Hemingway's Swahili, he's like a man who has a couple of servants who can say, you know, mumpa sigara, you know, we 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 kabisa sana, you know, the way you talk to your cook. He could do that, but he didn't speak Swahili. I could speak grammatical Swahili. Who is he? He's a white hunter. He's got money. He kills animals. I'm not interested in that. So Hemingway's Africa is a fraud. Hemingway himself was a very unhappy and, I think, demented person. And his books were wildly overrated. I mean, another example I could say is that when you read Simenon, you realize that Simenon has something that Albert Camus attempted to have but doesn't have. There's a book called Le Veuve Couduc. It's translated as um, The Widow. Le Veuve that's, yeah, that's as good as L'Etranger. It may be better. 
that was played by Simon Signore in a film. There's an aspect of Simon that's better than Camus, much better than Camus. Yeah, but and, he was not considered. First of all, Simenon and Camus lived in a moment where Camus was a communist, right, and left-wing intellectual, and Simenon was considered a man who had collaborated with the Nazis, yeah, which yeah, was yeah. not exactly a good thing after the war, right? And in the same time, he was well known as a mystery writer more than a serious literary writer like Camus. That's true. I don't know, but, but, they were coming from opposites. That's true. Camus is also a compromised person. I mean, he was, as an El, what do you call it, a pied noir, I mean, he was a um, Algerian. He was against Algerian independence. He fell out with Sartre because of Algeria. I mean, the, the complaint that a lot of people have with Camus was that he was on the wrong side. He was basically a colonialist. I mean, he was on the side of the colonialists. When you read La Peste, name a character in La Peste who's an Arab. There are no Arabs in his book. There are no women in his book. Yeah, there are Arabs in l'étranger, in the stranger, the foreigner, I don't know, l'étranger. Yeah, there's an Arab, he kills an Arab. Now, what do you think, when you said that one has to read, it comes to my mind, did you read a small book by Ezra Pound called How to Read? Yeah, I've read it. I read it when I was a student. I loved Ezra Pound. You know why I read Ezra Pound? Because Jack Kerouac, mentioned Ezra Pound on the road. He mentioned Ezra Pound. I, I thought, I'm going to read Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound was a crazy man, but I mean, ultimately brilliant and crazy. I've mentioned a lot of uh, mental conditions of writers, but they do have mental conditions. But I would say, yes, I read the AB. He wrote a book called How to Read. He wrote a book called How to Write, the ABCs of Writing, and his letters, Ezra Pound's letters, which I read. I read when I was 17 or 18 years old. I loved his letters. Reading People who read occupy a special category in my life, people who read. Because if someone reads, you're a reader. I can talk to you. You have yes. a bookshelf there. I'm looking at your books. You're a reader. Readers have a language, a special language that they can use that no other people have. I live in Hawaii. I'm in Hawaii now. No one reads here. No one. I don't know a single person. The, I'm Paul. Uh -huh. And I go sailing. I go kayaking. I go swimming with people. I know a lot of surfers. I know a lot of people here. They don't read. So I'm speaking to them in a certain register because they don't read. When I go to the mainland, if I go to Boston or something, I meet people who read and I'm speaking to them in a different way. But sometimes there was a man here. He was the biographer of Henry James called Leon Adele. He wrote the five volume biography of Henry James, Leon Adele, E-D-E-L. I used to have lunch with him 30 years ago. What a man. So he had read every. He'd read Edmund Wilson. He had read Turgenev. He had read, obviously, all of Henry James. And we used to talk. After he died, there was no one to talk to. So I can have conversations with people, but it's like talking in a different language. But when you're a reader and you meet another reader, you're able to converse. You have a range of reference. But why don't you live in a place where people read? I hate the weather, in, probably. It would be a metropolitan place. I don't like living in city. Cities are nasty places. You have to live in an apartment. You have There are people all the time. There are people talking. It's noisy. It's interrupted. I can only live in a quiet place with good weather. So it's true that when I go to New York or Paris or London, I meet writers and I can talk to them. But I wouldn't live in a city. So it's a compromise that you make. I mean, I'm not the only person who did it. Robert Graves lived in Mallorca. I mean, could you imagine a writer living in Mallorca <laughs> in a tourist paradise? Robert Graves, one of the most intellectual and also very prolific writer, he's living in Mallorca with tourists on the beach. Graham Greene was living in Antibes and in Capri on some... Yeah, yeah, that's right. He hated it. And Somerset Maugham was living in uh, Cap Ferrat. Many writers lived in... But Somerset Maugham lived in a mansion. He lived in the house, the Villa Moresque. It was the house that the confessor of, um, I think it was um, King Leopold's priest, the priest that attended to King Leopold had this house. Was it Cap Ferrat? Cap, Cap Ferrat, Ferrat. Yes. Yeah. And so it was a mansion. So he was nice and quiet. He had servants and it was all fine. But he was also a, a very influential figure. He seemed to live an admirable life, traveled, made money. His books were very successful. He wrote plays. He seemed to be someone... To emulate. Lucky, lucky man. But he wasn't happy at all. I mean, 
You know, the other thing that I'm interested in, he, when Graham Greene hated to be alone. So when Graham Greene traveled, he always traveled with someone else. When Somerset Mom traveled, he always traveled with someone else. Seymour Can you always traveled, travel by yourself? Yeah, I must travel alone. I like other people, but you can't write with other people. I can't. I when can't you have... travel, you meet people, right? You talk to people. You yes. You yes. get involved in stories or things. Yeah, that's right. And if you travel with someone else, you're talking to that person, or the person is saying to, you, "Hey, Paul, look at that." Or, "Hey, Paul, look, look at." Or, if, and your conversation is with so your you don't companion. You travel with your wives or girlfriends. Well, no, I travel with my wife. I don't have a girlfriend at the moment, but I, my wife and I travel, but I don't write. I mean, we went to Norway, lovely place. I traveled around Norway. I didn't write anything. I love traveling with my wife, but I can't write when traveling with my or with anyone else. Even Steve McCurry, lovely man, photographer. I can't, if I'm traveling with him, he's taking pictures. I can only write alone. I can only dream alone. I can only travel alone. Writing is incompatible with any other aspect of life. It's incompatible with teaching. It's incompatible with being an accountant. It's incompatible with being a doctor. Chekhov could tell you that. Chekhov had to stop being a doctor. He was a good doctor. You know, he was a doctor and he was right. But he Dr. Thomas had- Mom was a doctor. That's right. And Voltaire was a doctor, as we know. Yes. But the writing life is not compatible with anything else. Friendship. Right. Because it's a solitary, at its best, at its most productive, it's a solitary, inward, monastic calling. And you can't, just like, I suppose, if you were a monk in Tibet, it's not compatible with being with anyone else. It's a form of prayer. It's a form of meditation. It's not compatible. The human voice is very interrupted to me. If someone talks to me, and well, we're talking now, but I won't be able to go from our conversation to my desk very easily. I mean, I might sit down, but I won't be able to write. My head is full of, full of our conversation, which is very pleasant, but it's also interruptive. I'm sure you understand that. But at the end of the day, if you had to think of Paul Theroux, right? If you were someone else and look at Paul Theroux, Paul Theroux is famous as a novelist, he's famous as a travel writer. You don't like uh, travel writers. Who are you? How would you define yourself as a writer? I mean, as you're not a poet, which is easier, because if you are a poet, you say, I'm a poet. But who are you? What kind of writer you are? And which are the books that you're more proud of that you wrote? That's a very so that difficult question to add. The who am I is difficult because, in a way, the process of writing describes who the writer is. So the writer is defining himself with each book or herself. The nature of writing is introspection. I happen to be very lucky. So I was born in 41. After the World War II, the world changed. It was different. Europe had to rebuild. America had to cope with the modern world. So in the 1950s, the 50s was an explosive period where writers like Jack Kerouac or Henry Miller or whoever, people were experimenting in a very interesting way. So I wasn't interested in Hemingway, but the luck of my life was that I came of age in the 1960s at a time when countries in Africa and elsewhere were becoming independent. So the anti-colonial movement or the decolonization of countries arrived at the same time as my coming of age, as the cultural revolution in China which was 10 years, from 66 to 76. Decolonization in Africa, Cultural Revolution, Mao Zedong, the explosive events in France, the Avenement. All of that was part of my life, my early life, my, when I was becoming a writer. And that was very stimulating. It was very stimulating to live through that period, to be I, at an age, I was in my 20s then, and that was really, really wonderful. And so you ask who I am. I'm the child, I suppose, a product of the 1960s, but also a product of America in the 1950s. So I came of age then, and decolonization was very important to me. So when I, I'm always thinking of this sense of liberation, of people being liberated, and then also the contradiction. So I also lived through a period where countries became independent, and then they became dictatorships. So imagine the luck of that, to see a country that was colonized become independent and then become a dictatorship. Well, that's amazing. So that has been my subject in a way. But when I think of what I've done, I often think 
What's my subject? My subject is a man alone. And most of my books are about a person, usually a man, somewhat like myself, with a problem that needs to solve a problem. The Mosquito Coast is about a man with a problem. The Lower River, a man with a problem. My book, Burma Sahib, is George Orwell as a young man, Eric Blair. He's in Burma. He's a man with a problem. He's a policeman. When you're a traveler, you're a man with a problem. How do you go from A to B to C to D alone? You have to solve that problem. It's a geographical problem. And so this problem solving, this emergence of a self is something that has become, I suppose, my subject. And I've lived long enough. You know, George Orwell's total literary career was 16 years. 16, you know, it's nothing. It's nothing. He published his first book in 1933, and then he died in 1950. But so 1984 was published in 1949. And, you know, that's a very short life, short literary life. Mine has been long. My literary life, you talk about the number of books I've written. Well, I've been writing for 60 years almost. How could I fail? If you need to feed a family, you need to make a living. And if you hate, as I do, I don't want a job. I don't want a boss. Well, it that you end up writing a lot of books to make a living. But my subject is the man with a problem, as I said. And so that's who I am. I think as a writer, I'm a man with a problem. That was my position in the world, in my family. My problem was my family. I've written a book about my novel about my family. I felt alienated in my family. I wanted to leave my family and get away and have my own life. And so I did. Are you starting a new book uh... And the title will be A Man with a Problem. No, well, <laughs> all my books are A Man with a Problem. My next book is a book of short stories. I've just finished submitting it. It's called The Vanishing Point. In a picture, this point of view, this perspective is The Vanishing Point. So that's a big book of short stories. And I'm wondering, I would like to write a travel book. So my ancestors came from Toulouse in 1693. My original ancestor was recruited by King Louis XIV's men and sent to New France and to what was to be Quebec. I realized now, so he went there in the 17th century, pre-revolutionary, young French peasant, habitant. And I would like to write about him and Canada. And I'd like to take a road trip in Canada. If I, as they say, inshallah, if I'm spared, I would like to do that maybe this year get my car, drive around Canada. Canada is a country that Americans don't know. If you ask the average person in the United States, who's the prime minister of Canada? What's the population of Canada? They won't know. They will have no idea. Canadians know a lot about the United States. So my next book will probably be a travel book. And you're not going to Toulouse. I have been there. The actual village, I've been to Toulouse. I've been to the village. It's called Verdun sur Garonne. And Garonne is the river and a canal that goes to Toulouse and then goes to the Mediterranean. And so if you go to verdun sur garonne and you go to the church of Saint-Michel, you see in the front of the church, there's a plaque that says Antoine Terreau went to New France in 1693. He was a member of this parish. It's there, very prominent. So and that's the beginning of your book? Maybe, maybe not. It would be a prologue. He was a very, you know, <laughs> the famous people in Canada are Lamothe Cadillac, Frontenac, Subercas. So Antoine, my ancestor, worked, was a soldier, was a mariner, actually, for each one of these people. He knew Frontenac. Well, Frontenac was the governor general and was a general, and it was chasing around and killing people. Lamothe Cadillac, who was a very dubious character, but founded Detroit, the city of Detroit. My ancestor was in Detroit when there were only 63 people there. So he was there in 1701. So it's an interesting family. I'm proud of my French ancestry and proud of the fact that... It's your, it's your Mayflower kind of book. <laughs> no, it'll be a travel book. Your... It'll be a, I, I'll tell you the kind of book that interests me most is hearing people's stories. You know, we talked about Carlo Levi. When Carlo Levi was in... Aliano, he wasn't in Eboli, he was in Aliano. Christ stopped at Eboli, didn't get to Aliano. He told people stories. He was interested in people's stories. I've always, as a traveler, I've been interested in the stories that people have to tell. And so if I wrote about Canada, it would be to listen to people, to meet people, and hear what stories they have about their lives. So that would be my ambition. I don't know whether I'll do it. I mean, I'm 
talking about this as though it's a fait accompli, but it's not a fait accompli. It's, it's just an idea. Thank you. I wish you good luck. Alan L. Can interviews.